good morning. Glad that you're here this morning. I want to speak to you this morning in this series leading up to our 150th anniversary as a church. We're focusing on revival. We're, tomorrow we enter into 40 days of fasting and prayer. In fact, when you leave today out in the foyer, you can pick up one of these 40 days fasting and prayer booklets and it's a place for you to journal during these 40 days. There's some specific things we're asking you to pray for. And I would encourage all of you to take advantage of this. Let's really press into the Lord during this time as we move to that special occasion in the life of the church. Now tonight at six o'clock, we're gonna have a night of prayer from six o'clock to seven o'clock in the fellowship hall. I wanna encourage all of you to come and we're gonna have a time of worship interspersed with prayer as we seek the face of God together corporately as a body of Christ. And then tomorrow, we begin the 40 days of fasting and prayer. Now, you can fast however the Holy Spirit leads you to fast. Nobody's telling you what you got. Certainly, we're not telling you don't eat anything for 40 days because I don't think any, I know I couldn't do that. I, it takes a Moses to do something like that. So, this morning, I want you to take your Bible, turn to the minor prophet Hosea. Hosea in the Old Testament, if you'll go to Daniel and turn right, that next book is Hosea. Hosea, we're going to look today specifically at verse 12, and I'm going to speak to you on this subject, the revived heart. Let me ask you, has your heart grown cold and indifferent to the things of God? Do you feel as if God is a million miles away? Henry Blackaby spoke to this issue when he wrote these words. He said, there is no compromise or middle ground. Clearly, the departure of our hearts from God is serious. In fact, it can be spiritually fatal. Ground zero for our spiritual struggle is our heart. Now, not our, not our physical heart, but our spiritual heart. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, uh, Solomon wrote, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 the Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And then that verse ends with this, speaking to King Asa, you have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. So it's God's desire to strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. But when our, not, our hearts are not completely His, when we have a divided heart, then God it seems to be a million miles away, and God's discipline will be sure to come. Now, God's covenant people of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, had a serious, serious heart issue. They had become very prosperous. But instead of being good managers of what God had given them, good stewards, they used their money to mistreat people who were poor. They used their money to go further and further and further into the, into the, the depths of idolatry. The Bible says here in, in chapter 10, in verse Two, no, notice verse 2, their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. They were unfaithful to God. That word, that word faithless there in verse 2 can be translated as smooth 
or oily or slick. The idea is that the people went through the motions with God. They, they, they said they were worshipers of God, but in their hearts, they were also worshiping their idols, Baal and the other idols that they had fallen in love with. It, it's a picture of a disloyalty to the living creator God. What an indictment this was to the covenant people of God. They couldn't decide whose team they were on. Were they on God's team or were they on Baal's team? Now, the very fact that there, that, that question was up in the air indicated that their heart was in trouble. Their heart was divided. Their heart was faithless. And I tell you, it created a stench in the nostrils of God. And God said to the covenant people of Israel, I'm going to judge you for your divided heart. I'm going to judge you. And in 722 uh, uh, BC, God sent the Assyrians to take the northern kingdom into exile, the entire northern kingdom. Now, for, for us, there's hope. For them, there was still hope. That's what our verse uh, focuses on today. In verse 12, the Bible says, So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. Now this powerful verse reveals a very relevant truth for us in this room today, not just for Israel in their time. You see, God wants to revive your heart. I could go to every, every row. I could go to every person and I can tell you if you're, if you're a born again believer, it's God's will that your heart be revived and stay revived until Jesus comes. That's his will. And I could go to every pew. If you're not saved today, if, if you, you haven't been redeemed, I could go to you today and I could look you now and tell you it's God's will that you repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Through the pen of the prophet Hosea, God lays out the proper steps for a revived heart. Here's the first step. Are you ready? Number one, live like God wants you to live. You say, Pastor, I, I don't want to have this distance between me and God any longer. Pastor, I have been so divided in my loyalty and my priorities. I'm ready to get right with God. I'm ready to be revived. Well, you say, Pastor, what do I need to do? Number one, live like God wants you to live. There's a spiritual law that operates that is just as real as a law of gravity. Yeah, I could take a, a, a book here in my hand, and if I release that book, I promise you, I promise you, that book is not going to go up to the ceiling. That book is going to fall in the floor, and it'll make some of you, when it hits, it makes a noise, make some of you who are dozing right now, jump, jump and get awake real quick, I promise you. See, it's a law of gravity. And just as there is a law of gravity, there is a law of sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, Paul wrote, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. That, my friend, is the law of sowing and reaping. I want you to hear God's clear direction to the people of Israel in their day. Now, remember, their hearts were way away from God. They had divided loyalty. And God says to them, sow with a view to righteousness. Every word that comes out of your mouth, 
And every action of your life is, in fact, a sowing. You are sowing a seed with every word and every action of your life. The question is this, what kind of seeds are you sowing? Are you sowing good seeds or are you sowing bad seeds? Now, what does this mean practically for us? Well, it simply means that obedience to the word of God is a must if we're going to experience a revived heart. You see, God's word speaks very clearly as to how he wants us to live. And if we take God's word and we, we learn God's word and we apply God's word to our lives, then we can live the way God wants us to live and our hearts can be revived. Do you know what will happen when you decide that you want to be right with God? Do you know what will happen when you decide that you want to do, you want to live the way God wants you to live, that you really want to please him? Look at this next phrase here, reap in accordance with kindness. Now in the Hebrew language, this little phrase here, so, this verb so is an imperative. It's a command from God. God is saying to the people of Israel, and he's saying to us today, if you really want to have a revived heart, I command you, I command you to sow seeds of righteousness. If you really want to have a revived heart, God commands us to reap in accordance with kindness. That word kindness, you could write the word steadfast love. Or, or the word mercy over that. You see, it was not God's will to punish the children of God, the, the is, Israelites. It was God's will that they be revived. It was God's will that they worship him and worship him alone. And he says right here, if you will live like I want you to live, then you can reap what I want you to reap. And that's the mercy of God. You can, you can avoid the judgment of God by doing what I want you to do, to live the way I want you to live. In Proverbs 28, 13, the, uh, Solomon wrote, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. And that's what God promises here. You, you see, to, to live the way God wants you to live is not a burden. It's a blessing. It is a blessing. So here's the truth that can literally lead to a massive transformation in your life. I, I, wanna, I wonder how many folks in this room, how many folks watching live stream really want to have a revived heart. You really want to draw near to God. The Bible says in the book of James that if we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. Isn't that what you really want? Do you want to go through this life and feel this, this distance between you and your creator, God, you and your savior? I know you don't. I know you want to feel close to him. And the way to feel close to him, the way to draw near to him is to live like God wants you to live. That's when God will revive your heart. So secondly, what would, what, what's the next step? Number two, do what God wants you to do. Do what God, live like God wants you to live. Do what God wants you to do. Hear the word of the Lord. He says, break up your fallow ground. Now, my grandfather was a farmer. And he raised cantaloupes and watermelons and tomatoes and he sold them. That was his, his job. That was the way he made a living. And I often wondered why my grandfather did not plant his watermelons in the same field every year. You know what he did? He would plant his watermelons in this field this year. And then the next year, he wouldn't plant them there. He would plant them somewhere else. Now, you, you say, well, why? Uh, he knew something about farming. And he knew if those watermelons were going to be productive and produce the biggest crop possible so he and my grandmother could 
afford to live, then he had to make sure that he allowed some of that farmland to go fallow. Now, to be fallow means simply that you, you leave it unplowed and, and unplanted for a year's time. It's land that going, is going dormant. Now, I noticed something. When my grandfather would allow a field to go dormant or fallow, the next year when he got ready to plant something there, all kinds of weeds and saplings had started to grow up in that, and the, the field had become rather hard. And so the first thing my grandfather would do, he would hook up his four to eight end tractor to turning plows. And turning plows are designed to go deep in the ground and to turn the ground over and, and exposing all of those weeds and saplings and all that kind of stuff. And once he, he used the turning plows, he would go back and he would disc that piece of land at least two times to absolutely rip up and destroy and break up all of that junk that he had turned over. And now good soil is there for the seed. And that's the key to a good crop. And that was true for my grandfather. It was true also in the time that Hosea lived. Let me ask you a question. Was there ever a time in your life when the Lord produced spiritual fruit through you, when you felt real close to the Lord, well, let me ask you, what's happened? What's happened? Has your heart become fallow ground? Has it become hard? Is your heart filled with weeds and briars and useless saplings? Would you allow the Spirit of God to place the sharp tip of the Word of God into your heart that is fallow? And would you allow Him to turn over all of that junk and expose good soil for the seed of the Word of God? I tell you, God wants to rip out all the twisted and tangled root systems of carnality in your life. And if you really want to have a revived heart, this has to take place. You got to do what God wants you to do. So my question to you is, do you want to have a revived heart? Do you want the Holy Spirit of God to bring fresh life to you? Do you want to have a fresh spring in your spiritual step? Do you really want to draw near to the Lord so he will draw near to you? I tell you, there are two steps you got to take. You got to live like God wants you to live. You got to do what God wants you to do. And, and listen, the third one is this. Here's the third step. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Let me read verse 12 again, the whole thing. Let's put it all together. So with a view to righteousness, remember every word you say, every deed you do, you're sowing. Either you're sowing good stuff or you're sowing bad stuff. And the Bible says here, God's commanding us to sow with a view to righteousness. So God is commanding us to sow righteous words and righteous deeds. And he says, reap in accordance with kindness, the mercy and the steadfast love of God. I tell you, friend, if you sow, if you sow with a view to righteousness, you will reap in accordance with the mercy and the steadfast love of God. Wouldn't you like to live knowing that you are under an open heaven where the mercy and the steadfast love and compassion of God is pouring into your life daily. I tell you, that's the only way to live. And then he said, break up your fallow ground. Break it up. Get rid of all that, that twisted, gnarly, carnal stuff in your heart and get rid of it so that you can really be productive for the cause of Christ. 
And then he said, look at this, for it is time to seek the Lord. I, I tell you what, I, I think that's more true today than it's ever been. Because I'm going to be honest with you, we're running out of time. I put an article on my Facebook page yesterday about the coming of Christ. And I believe that the coming of Christ is near. We're seeing the whole world in meltdown. We're seeing the most insane stuff you could ever imagine happening in America and in the world today. We're seeing earthquakes absolutely multiply all over the world. We're seeing things happen we've never seen happen before. And God is saying, you better get ready. You better get ready. My son is coming soon. And the Bible says here, for it is time to seek the Lord. That time is running out very, very quickly until he comes to rain righteousness on you. So seek the Lord with all your heart. That's the third step we've got to take. Do you see that word seek? Now just look at it for just a moment. When you see that word seek, what comes to your mind? You know what comes to my mind? I I think of those unfortunate moments when a little boy or little girl is lost. They may get get lost in the woods. They may get lost in the city. And everybody stops everything they're doing, and they go and they start looking for that little boy and that little girl. And they will expend every effort. They will do anything necessary to find that lost child. That's what it means to seek. And then also think of a a heat-seeking missile. A heat-seeking missile. Man, it's just zeroing in on its target, ready to blow it to smithereens. That's what the word seek means. It's a word of passion. The Pharisees sought the Lord, but they sought him in the wrong way. Jesus said something to the Pharisees that was absolutely shocking. In John 8, 21, Jesus said to these Pharisees, He said, I go away, look at this now, and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. And where I'm going, you cannot come. Now that's shocking, isn't it? Jesus said, you'll seek me, but you'll die in your sin and you won't be able to come where I'm going. What did they do wrong? Here's what they did wrong. They sought the Lord on their terms, not his terms. And we're doing the same thing today in the world today. There are so many people who are seeking Jesus today, but they want salvation without repentance. They want a relationship with God without any strings attached. They want to please the Lord without offending the devil. Let me ask you, do you really want God to revive your heart and to flood your life with his compassion, his mercy, and his steadfast love? Listen, you must seek the Lord passionately. Jeremiah's words capture the essence of what it means to seek God. In Jeremiah 29, 13, Jeremiah said, you will seek me. This is words words of God. You will seek me and find me when you search for me. How? With all your heart. With all your heart. Arthur Gossip nailed it when he wrote, so Christ claims you to work for him, to live for him, to die for him, the whole of you, to offer to go shares with him, to grant him some place in your life is to insult him. To him, faith means a passion, an enthusiasm, a consuming zeal that eats up all of one's life. It is a love that keeps back nothing. You see, what does it mean to seek the Lord? It means you seek him passionately. And it means that you seek him personally. You know what? Nobody can seek the Lord for you. Parents cannot seek the Lord for their teenagers And teenagers cannot seek the Lord for their parents. 
Nobody can seek the Lord for you. You have to decide that he means more to you than anybody or anything on this planet, and you seek him with all your heart. Listen, as a pastor, I can't seek the Lord for you. Your connect group teacher cannot seek the Lord for you. You must decide that you will seek the Lord even if nobody else does. You know, I thought about Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego carried into exile in Babylon. And these four boys, they decided they were going to seek the Lord with all their heart. And they refused to eat the king's food. They refused to drink the king's wine because they wanted to please God. They wanted to honor God and God honored them for honoring him. I I thought of Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob, carried into Egyptian slavery because his brother sold him to some uh, guys going in a caravan to Egypt. And Joseph is all alone there in Egypt. There's nobody that he can share the truth with. There's nobody who can encourage him. But I'll tell you what, Joseph was determined that he was going to go alone, that he was going to seek the Lord with all of his heart. And God blessed him. And God used him in an amazing way to preserve the people of God, the covenant people of God. I'm certainly not suggesting to you that it's easy to seek the Lord, to seek him passionately and to seek him personally. You know, you, you may seek the Lord with all your heart, and and I'm telling you, this may happen to you. Your friends may think that you've gone off your rocker. Your friends may say that you're carrying your faith too far, that you've become a fanatic. I'll tell you, who cares what they think? Listen, the most important thing in our lives as born-again believers is to please the Lord our God. Paul said, my ambition in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, is to please the Lord. And I'll tell you, you will never, ever seek the Lord properly unless you decide that pleasing him is more important to you than pleasing your friends or your family. you got to decide for yourself. And we must seek the Lord promptly, for it is time to seek the Lord, the Bible says. Seeking the Lord is something we need to do every day, but there are special occasions when the grace of God is made available to us. On those occasions, we need to really hone in and press into God and seek him with all of our heart. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 55, 6. He wrote, seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, what does that mean? There may be a time when he can't be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Listen, call upon him while he is near. I tell you, there's those special moments in your life when the Holy Spirit of God begins to work in your heart and the Holy Spirit of God begins to draw you to Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God drops the plumb bob of his word right in the middle of your heart and shows you that some action, some deed, some words that are coming out of your mouth, some deeds that you do with your life, they are totally contrary to what the Bible teaches and they offend God. And in those moments, those special moments, when God comes close to you and shows you that what you're doing is wrong, that's the time to seek him promptly. That's the time to bow your knees to Jesus and say, Lord, not my will be done, but yours be done. Lord, you are my Lord. You have the right to tell me what to do, when to do, and how to do. And Lord, I choose to please you above myself. I want your will, not my will, to be done. It's a favorable moment. I believe that this is a favorable moment for people in this room. I believe this is a favorable moment for people watching live stream today. It's a favorable moment. And God wants to do something special in your life. God wants to revive your heart. God wants to redeem you if you're lost. 
Listen, you must seek the Lord. You must seek him passionately. You must seek him personally. You must seek him promptly. And, and you must seek the Lord persistently. Look, look at this last phrase. Don't miss it. Look at it. Verse, verse 12. So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. How long? How long shall we seek the Lord? You, you know, we are, we are so spoiled. We, we think if, if we seek the Lord today, then, then all heaven needs to drop blessings in our hearts this afternoon. But do you realize that sometimes there's a delayed effect? Sometimes, sometimes God says, I need to see your persistence. I need to see that you're serious about this. Until he comes to reign righteousness on you. God promises real righteousness, not the fake stuff that the world offers, but real righteousness. This is the kind of righteousness that turns your heart into an undivided heart, a heart that is revived, a heart that places Jesus on the throne. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 14, the Bible says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people, look at verse 14, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Boy, that is a great passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, look at this, and that he is a rewarder of those who what? What does it say? Those who what? Those who seek him. It's right here in the scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, it's a principle that runs throughout scripture. Let me say this to you. You will never in your life, if you're a born again believer, you will never in your life regret having a revived heart. You will never regret making sure that Jesus has all of your heart. You will never regret living like he wants you to live and doing what he wants you to do and, and, and seeking him with all your heart. You'll never regret that. But if you're not a believer, you don't need a revived heart. You need a redeemed heart. You need to be saved. Listen, God wants to revive your heart. I have no doubt about that. There are steps that you must take. Live like God wants you to live. I'm going to ask you a question today. Will you pray a prayer like this and mean it in your heart? I just wrote out a little prayer. God, right here at this point where I've been both blind and stubborn, do a fresh work in my life. Create in my heart a desire to live the way you want me to live. Help me to sow good seeds that will produce much spiritual fruit for your glory. Will you pray something like that today? Will you say, Lord, whatever it is, you just take my life, my deeds, my words, and Lord, you measure them against the standard of your word. And if I'm off kilter anywhere, Lord, show me and help me to want to live the way you want me to live. Help me to make sure that my life measures up to your standards, the standards of your word. I want to encourage you today, if you're a born again believer, when we issue the invitation here in just a moment, you come to this altar. You bow before the Lord, and you say to the Lord, Lord, whatever it is in my life, 
that does not measure up to your word, Lord, show me and help me to want to do it your way, not my way. And number two, do what God wants you to do. Maybe some of you have fallow ground in your heart and your heart has become hard. The Bible says in Psalm 95, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. See, every time the Spirit of God comes near and speaks to your heart about something in your life and you ignore it, the Bible says your heart gets a little harder and a little harder and a little harder. And and the seed of God's Word that's sown into your life by a preacher, by a teacher, or, or, or by a friend or a family member, the seed of the Word of God just bounces off because your heart has become so hard. Maybe your fallow ground is bitterness or unforgiveness or pride or greed or legalism or unbelief or an immoral relationship. These things have to go if we genuinely want our Lord to clear our hearts, revive our hearts, and make it, make us in a, put us in a position where we can be close to the Lord again, where he can purify us and make sure that we, our hearts are not divided. And then number three, seek the Lord with all your heart. This is a time to seek the Lord passionately, personally, promptly, and persistently. At stake for every believer in this room, at stake is the abundant life of Christ that he wants you to have. It's the steadfast love of God, the mercy of God. And I would encourage you as a born again believer, you make sure that your heart is clear that there are no things competing with the Lord Jesus for your love and your devotion. The Bible, Jesus said this, you you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Is that the way your heart is? I'm going to ask you today, come to this altar if you're a believer, get right with God. If you're not a believer, If you're not a believer, I want you to know that this is one of those special moments when the extended hand of the grace of God is there for you, and he's offering you forgiveness of sin. He's offering you his grace and mercy. Don't don't insult God by rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, Jesus loves you. We sang about it earlier, about the love of God. And Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He was raised from the dead so that you could have eternal life, so that you could spend all of eternity with him. And he's here today. And he wants to forgive you and save you just like he did Cecilia. Cecilia Perkins, that was baptized. I'm telling you, that sister is on fire for Jesus. And I praise God that when the hand of God's grace and mercy was extended to her in that class at night, that she said yes to Jesus. Amen? You can say yes to Jesus today. I'm going to ask our staff to come, our worship team to come. And in just a moment, we're all going to stand and we're going to worship. Now, look, here's something I can't do. I can't twist your arm and make you want to have a revived heart. That's something the Holy Spirit has to do. I I can't twist your arm and make you give your heart to Jesus. That's something the Holy Spirit must do. But you must listen to the Spirit of God. And today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. God wants to revive your heart today. Let him have his way in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Father, if you gave us what we deserved, we would all be separated from you for all of eternity. But Lord, you are a God of infinite grace and mercy and love, steadfast love. 
And I praise you, Lord, that if we live like you want us to live, if we do what you want us to do, and if we seek you with all of our heart, that you will display, you will give that mercy and grace and steadfast love to us, and you will help us to have a revived and redeemed heart. Oh God, have your way in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name.